While your day is winding down, they're just getting started. This is South Coast Tonight with Chris McCarthy and Marcus Farrow. They've got you covered on all the news of the day, from local issues to politics on both sides of the aisle. This is the place where the movers and shakers come to be heard, to listen, and where they're held accountable. This is South Coast Tonight on WBSM. Hey, welcome back. I'm uh, I'm Marcus. I'm Chris. And we're joined now uh, by Jeff Deal. Hey, Rip Deal. Hey, Marcus. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Doing, thanks for Thank thanks you. for coming on. So, um, you know, it's the day before election. You are, uh, you know, the polls haven't been good, but how are you feeling about your chances tomorrow? Well, I mean, you know, let's be honest, Republicans in Massachusetts, usually the polls aren't favorable leading up to elections. But, you know, we've been known to pull them out once in a while. It's Scott true. Brown was a big one. Uh, Charlie Baker was even down. But, you know, here's true. the thing. We're looking at the um, we're looking at the early voting numbers right now, and they're really significantly lower than they were in 2020. Obviously, that was a pandemic year and that 65 percent of people had voted early before Election Day. But we're down around 22 percent, I think, was the total vote, you know, almost like a, a, a third of what, you know, early voting was before. So we're also looking at big cities being down around 10%. So it doesn't feel like there's enthusiasm um, necessarily in cities, which tend to, you know, I think have more of a Democratic vote. Um, I know Kamala Harris came in last week. I think they were trying to spark the base to get more excited, but it it feels like it's just been a very quiet race. And, you know, I think that usually uh, uh, something that we look at in our modeling is, is benefiting us. So we'll see. Obviously, tomorrow is a big day and the results are in, but I you know, again, we put in everything we could do to to make sure we ran the race that we wanted to run, and I'm excited to find out what the results are. What are your thoughts on Kamala Harris coming to to Boston to rally with, uh, you know, Maura Healy, Kim Driscoll, Andrea Campbell, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think it was look, them looking at the numbers and saying, look, I think we need to motivate the base more. Um, I'm not sure if it did that because, again, the results are a week later that it doesn't look like the numbers are, are that much higher. Um, obviously, you know, President Biden never came to Massachusetts uh so I don't know. They, they must have thought maybe they didn't need to, but her coming at the last minute, you know, I don't know. We'll we'll see. I guess there'll be a lot of uh, Monday morning Monday morning quarterbacking this this thing when it's all over. But uh, it has been an interesting campaign. Obviously, nationally, uh, I feel like that story has sucked a lot of oxygen out of Massachusetts. You know, and at the same time, uh, you know, been campaigning for a year and a half, traveling around the state. So, you know, I, I just have to trust that I've done the job of reaching as many people as I can. Uh, you know pulling those votes out where I can. And uh, we'll see where Massachusetts decides to go for the future. Either way, you know, I'm really glad, though, that we had those debates, two of them, with Maura Healy. I appreciated that. Kim Driscoll didn't do debates with my uh, my running mate, Leah Allen. That was too bad. I thought it would have been nice to have more discussions at the lieutenant governor's level. But all in all, I think people in Massachusetts understand what's at stake. And um, like, like I said, I've made my case. Um, but, you know, if, if I'm fortunate enough to serve... Uh, obviously, I want to continue to communicate with uh, people, and I, you having me on the show, uh, I think a few weeks ago was really great. Gave me a chance to, you know, obviously talk to a, an area of the state that's important. I used to work down in the New Bedford area, and you know, it's always great to be able to communicate, um, you know, on a show that's politically oriented. So, thank you very much for that opportunity. So, Jeff, let's be optimistic here for a second. You're victorious tomorrow. What's day one look like when you go, when you get to the governor's office? What's day one first thing Jeff Deal is going to do? Well, I've been promising it for a long time, and that is to rehire the state workers that were fired because of the vaccine mandate. Now we've seen uh, that New York State Supreme Court has ruled that the uh, state worker, or the city workers of New York City should be returned because the vaccine did not provide the protections they were told it would, and that's why they were fired. But even more telling is Charlie Baker hiring back now 50 people in different state agencies um, who didn't get the vaccine. I think... Uh, that's an admission to an extent that uh, it is time to um, give people those jobs back. And um, the one thing I'll disagree with Charlie on is that if you give at least one person their job back, they all should be offered it back. I don't know why 50 people are more important than, you know, over a thousand people or so that did that uh, lost their jobs because of a health care choice they should have been able to make for themselves. So that's day one. But there's a lot of things to work on. Obviously, the tea is an issue. Really, one of the things that hasn't been talked about during the campaign too much was the opioid crisis. It came back after the pandemic in a big way, and we lost the, the most overdose deaths in the state's history last year because of it. Uh, we've got to jump on that. We need more mental health and recovery services, and not just in cities. Um, we need to have them in the suburban towns so that people can be closer to families and jobs if they came from those areas. So I really want to make sure that that is something that we, we don't drop the ball on in the first 
day or the first hundred days. So um, you just had a rally, I believe, in Worcester today. I think former Senator and former Ambassador Brown was there, along with other uh, state, uh, a few, maybe a couple, uh, Leah Cole Allen, who we just had on, and uh, Jay McMahon. How, how did that go? Yeah, actually, it was last night at Mechanics Hall in Worcester. It was cool. Uh, Scott Brown has a band called The Diplomats. That's so, right. <laughs> you know, uh, pretty, pretty neat to have the former uh, senator and, and ambassador rocking out on stage and telling everybody, hey, look, I was down big time in the polls, and I ended up winning by seven. So, you know, again, just letting people know that uh, you just have to have faith and get out there and vote. And, um, you know, I, that was cool. And it was nice to have statewide candidates be able to make their case to a, a big audience. But we also had a rally a week before at Faneuil Hall and uh, filled that place. It was cool. Um, I've been traveling pretty much uh, across the state for the last month. I mean, last year and a half, but specifically the last month with big rallies everywhere. We just want to make sure people are motivated to vote, that they know that uh, their vote counts and that uh, it's important to... A lot of people uh, sacrificed to, to give us that right to vote. We've got to exercise that civic duty. And no matter who you vote for, Republican or Democrat or independent, just make sure you vote and weigh in because we need good leaders in this state. And um, I think the people definitely know what they want. So let's let's make it happen. So, Jeff, um, I think you would be, should you, should you get elected, the first governor since Paul Salucci, as I recall, who's had legislative experience. Um, one of the reasons that this state has elected Republicans in the past is as a check on the legislature. Um, share a little bit about that, your experience in the legislature. How do you think that'll impact you as a, as a governor? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I didn't even think about that. That's a great point. Uh, in 2010, when I ran for state rep, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never run a, been involved <laughs> in politics before. I got to Beacon Hill, and I certainly learned quickly. I was on the Ways and Means Committee. I think the Ways and Means Committee is just absolutely essential. It gives you the, a complete guide of how the state spends its money and where you do a good job and where the state needs some improvement. So having that experience was um really important and you're right that translates into knowing how the legislature works the democrats that um you know control the house and senate i know the chairmans i know the um of, of different committees i know how things operate so it is good to have a, a real you know immediate start with the legislature uh, a relationship with them and uh, an ability to, to uh, understand how bills are filed how they get uh, moved through um so that that's a great point by you and um you know, but look, I think Charlie Baker, he obviously was effective. He had served for eight years under Weldon Salucci in administrative positions, not in the elected office. Right. Uh, so he was able to come to the, the state house with a lot of experience as well. But um, again, knowing how Beacon Hill works is critical, I think, to make sure that you can uh, effectively communicate and um, deliver on the promises you make on the campaign trail. So um, uh, we appreciate you taking time to, to talk to us, uh, Rep Deal. I know that you're, you're really busy. It's election eve. You've been running a year and a half long campaign. So we appreciate you carving out this time for us. Before I let you go, you did say there was some, you know, you did you did compare your race a little bit to the Scott Brown, uh, Martha Coakley race in 2010. What parallels do you see uh, from that race and, and the race you have against uh, A.G. Healy? <laughs> well, I'm hoping that the curse of the AG continues where uh, we haven't had a Democratic AG make it to the corner office. And I think in eight times they've tried. I'm not sure if that's the right number, but uh, we'll see if this uh, if this happens or not. Look, I think Scott, uh, again, tapped into uh, a, a time where people were feeling frustrated with the national politics. And they decided that they did want to have at least one Republican be able to weigh in down in Washington. Um, again, I think we've had a history in Massachusetts of having, having a Republican governor at least be a voice uh, for a portion of the state that, you know, balances out the, the legislature that is a supermajority of Democrats in that House and Senate. So I'm looking forward to that tradition if it works out. And if it doesn't, I certainly want to keep on doing what I can to help Massachusetts move forward in my own way. But uh, it has been a true honor to serve in office and a real honor to be nominated and be considered for this and so tomorrow whatever happens i just am very grateful for the people who've helped me and again very grateful to folks like you who've had me on the show and let me just voice uh, what i'm about well, best of luck rep deal we thanks appreciate you coming on thank you both take good care. luck thanks all right uh we got to take a break w i'm marcus and i'm chris and we're joined by salem mayor and lieutenant governor nominee kim driscoll hey mayor driscoll hey marcus hey chris how you doing mayor Doing good. So uh, we saw you, well, I saw you yesterday at Buttonwood Park uh, with Rep Cabral, uh, Councilor Burgo, um, Mayor Haro. Uh, I, I asked Andrea Campbell this. I'll, I'll ask you the same question. Um, why was it important in the crucial days before the election to make a stop here in the South Coast? I mean, New Bedford is an important city as a gateway city mayor. I know uh, what happens on the ground there matters in the 
the lives of a lot of people who live and work there, and we want to make sure uh, that we're rallying people to get out to vote uh, and ensuring that we're going to have a strong partnership. So uh, we're speaking with um, Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll, the Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor. All right. So um, let's say tomorrow you're elected lieutenant governor, which seems likely Um, if uh, what's your and you get sworn in in January. I know a lot's going to be delegated by the Healy administration, but you're going to have a portfolio of your own. You're going to have your own discretion on on the things that you want to do. What's your first act as lieutenant governor? You know, I really hope that we can champion the work of cities, particularly gateway cities at the local level as someone who brings that lens to the work. I think uh, the incredible needs we have around infrastructure, I mean, I, just some of the basics around uh, roads and bridges and the work that needs to be laid out uh, and housing and initiatives like that. I know that uh, both Moore and I want to make sure we're really leaning into the affordability challenges. It's just getting so much harder to keep a roof over your head and food on the table. And those are the areas we're going to want to try and make a difference in as soon as we can. Um, Mayor Driscoll, look, I was very impressed with you when you came in. As I said, I'm a Republican, but you impressed me quite a bit. And I know that um, you'll have a large portfolio um, in the government um, with with Governor Healy. Um, One of the most important things you'll have an input on is the appointments to all these boards and commissions. The the government's enormous, and the Republicans have had it for a long time. The Democrats are going to have to replace a lot of people on these boards and commissions. Will you be taking applications from people here on the South Coast who have specific talents? Because that's really, as you know, people are policy. People are policy. Will we have an open door if we're qualified? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what we've talked about uh, since we've been campaigning together is the incredible ability to bring together the talent in Massachusetts to solve some of our toughest challenges. I think we recognize that there are uh, individuals uh, private partner part, private partners uh, who will live and work outside of the greater Boston area who have a lot to offer. So we are hoping uh, to be in a position to not only appoint individuals but bring a strong team uh, as we tackle the, you know some of the Commonwealth's greatest challenges. So we're speaking with uh, Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll, the Lieutenant Governor uh, nominee on the Democratic side. Um, Mayor Driscoll, we, we do appreciate how available you've made yourself to us. Um, you know, when I've asked for a quote, when you're when I'm out in the field, you've been happy to give me one. Uh, when we've talked, when I've talked with your staff, they've been happy to accommodate you appearing on this show. You came down from Salem to, to appear in studio with Chris and I, uh, and we really do appreciate that availability and that you value uh, local media markets. Uh, if you're elected Lieutenant Governor, um, will you continue that relationship with uh, local media markets? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you guys are fulfilling a really valuable role in helping us uh, make sure we're hearing from people. I loved when we did the call-in segment and also, you know, getting out information about things that we'll, that we'll be working on. So really grateful always, uh, Marcus and Chris, for the chance to come on. I think you have wide uh, listenership. Uh, whenever I'm on, I always hear from people who live in the region who let me know, hey, I heard you with Marcus. <laughs> Good. That's great. Um, so uh, I appreciate you coming on, Mayor Driscoll. Um, is there anything else you want to leave the audience with uh, before we let you go? Really just want to encourage everyone to vote. You know, we're excited about the opportunity uh, to, to, one, you know, lean into the work that I think matters to the quality of life and the places that people live. And the benefit of winning an election is you get to do the work. It's an honor and a privilege, and I hope folks will consider us if they're heading the polls tomorrow. And uh, we'll be back on. I, I think uh, that the South Coast and Greater New Bedford has a lot to offer, and we want to make sure we're maximizing all those opportunities. We'll be looking forward to that. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot, and good luck. Good luck. Good night, guys. Take Bye. care. Bye. Um, so we've got a call that's been waiting. Let's sure. Take him. Good evening. Hey there. Hey. Hey. Uh, I'm Sasha Cohen. I'm the deputy campaign manager for Chris Crawford, who's running for state treasurer against Deb Goldberg. Oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, I figured I'd call in to uh, to make our pitch sure, for sure. the uh, people of the South Coast. Yeah, that's the Libertarian Are candidate. Are you Libertarian? Yes. Oh, cool. Uh, so the Republicans don't have a candidate in the race, so there are only two people on the ballot tomorrow. Who, who, what's your candidate again? Uh, Christina Crawford. She is a wife, a homemaker, and a retired software engineer who lives in Sherborne. Um, she's been a resident of the state for 20 years. Her husband, Peter, is an oncologist. Um, and is just a wonderful member of the community. She's dedicated to fiscal conservatism and kind of turning around what's been going on in the Treasurer's office. You know, the, the sitting Democrat 
has tried to, instead of focusing on growing the pension funds, divesting from firearm manufacturers. She's just politically grandstanding for the radical left rather than focusing on the important job of managing the state's $100 billion in pension funds. And we need a voice for that fiscal conservatism. Well, I'm, you know, obviously very familiar with libertarianism. I'm not, you know, uh, that sophisticated with it because um, aren't libertarians against things like pension funds? So we believe that, you know, sometimes libertarians tend to fall in the line of we believe in private retirement accounts over state-managed ones, but what we do fundamentally believe, all of us, is that if the state takes on an agreement with workers that they're going to pay out pensions, those funds have to be managed responsibly, and it has to be handled so that people are fulfilled the obligations that are made to them. So one of the-, the state may deal with the workers, and it's the responsibility of the treasurer to keep those funds managed wisely. So one of the big issues that, that a lot of state pension funds are running into, and again, I'm doing this cold because I didn't realize you are going to call. I'm glad you did, though. Um, yeah, me too. Is the ESG movement, right? The um, the environmental, um, certain, some of the goals that are being used to manage the money, which is not getting the best of returns. It's almost a political movement of, of, of workers' money um, into, into political goals as opposed to fiscally responsible of, of, uh goals. Well, what's her position on that? I think her position is that asset management has to be done with a pure focus on profitability. Mm-hmm. It's $100 billion in assets, and the only goal of the treasurer should be to invest it as wisely as possible without regard to her political agenda. So, um, you know, uh, why did you think it was important to run a candidate in this race? The Republicans didn't, uh, maybe they didn't see Goldberg as a, a, a I don't know, a, a, a soft target. Why do you think it was important to run a candidate in this race? Well, I think it's important that there's not a single ballot line in the country where there is only one candidate. It's a disservice to the voters right. in, any, in any place to only have one option because that's not a real choice. And so we're happy to provide an alternative. And we're happy to provide a fiscally sound one. So, w- what will this do for the Libertarian Party um, in Massachusetts? Should she uh, get a good return uh, tomorrow at the, uh, at the Treasurer's office? Sure. So, with three percent of the vote, um, the Libertarian Party gains major party status within the state, which means people oh. can register as Libertarians as opposed to registering as other libertarians every democrat should vote for a libertarian this is a major this is a major opportunity be a major blow to the republicans i think yeah absolutely absolutely right? and she's actually polled um a recent umass poll put her at 37 percent um and in the same poll wow. both amore for auditor and mcmahon for ag polled at 32 uh, wow hold it at 29 or 30 so I actually believe that she has the best shot of any of the candidates on the ballot tomorrow of avoiding a, a statewide Democratic sweep. Hey, uh, listen, I appreciate you coming in. I appreciate that you valued uh, the time on this show. Um, and one more time, who is the candidate? Uh, Chris Crawford. Thanks for the call. We appreciate it, Sasha. Course. Thank yeah. you so much. That was interesting, Marcus. That was interesting. Uh, now we're do- uh, joined by uh, Diana DiSaglio. Hi, Senator. Hey, everybody. Great to be back on. Thanks so much for inviting me. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So um, we talked uh, We talked at, in Fall River uh, yesterday, uh, two days ago. It all blends together. Two days ago. Uh, and I, what you said to me was really interesting that um, cause you, you know, you're from the sort of the Merrimack Valley area. And what you said was the South Coast uh, feels a lot more like home. Why is that? Yeah, you know, look, I was I was born to a 17-year-old single mom. I grew up housing insecure, moved around quite a bit during my childhood. I waitressed and cleaned houses to pay my way through community college, ended up getting scholarships to become the first in my family to graduate. I know what it's like to struggle and to have to be scrappy to make ends meet. And, you know, the area that I come from, you know, the story is very similar for, for many of my neighbors and many of the working-class families in the communities that I grew up in, which is Missouin, Lawrence, you know, the, the greater Haverhill area, the greater Lowell area where I went to college. And, you know, when I come down to the South Coast, it's just, you know, I hear from a lot of working class folks who 
you know, want nothing more than for their family to be able to live with a standard of dignity in the community they grew up in, to be able to have access to health care and, you know, to uh, edu- a great education, to be able to live in the community that they're working in. You know, we're in a housing crisis right now. And, you know, it's just it's a story that so many struggling families across our communities have. And, uh, yeah, when I when I come down to the to the South Shore, I have to say that a lot of a lot of working families, you know, have expressed a lot of similar concerns that that, you know, the neighbors that, you know, live in my neighborhood have expressed to me regarding what they want the auditor to start looking at access to health care, access to mental health services, access to addiction resources, uh, access to a great education, regardless of family background, bank balance or zip code and the ability to live with a standard of dignity in the communities that they're working hard to serve in. So, um, you, I, I keep, I, I like to ask you about this every time you come on because it's very interesting to me and it's, it's inevitably going to lead to an SJC battle. I think, um, you want to audit the legislature and you feel like you have the legal authority to do so. Um, how are you going to get that done? And furthermore, how are you going to navigate the budgetary constraints that you may get from the legislature after the, after you decide to investigate them? Yeah, sure. So just for folks listening at home who might not know me, my name is Diana DiZoglio. I am a current state senator, so I actually serve in the state legislature right now. And I have to tell you that, you know, based on my 10 years of serving in the legislature, I can tell you that the legislature is in desperate need of an audit. It hasn't had a real audit through the auditor's office in quite a long time. Uh, So it has been done before in the past. It's just been many years since it has been done. The folks who say that it can't be done, I would, you know, recommend that uh, those folks take a look at the books from, from, uh, you know, several years ago when, when it actually used to be done down to, uh, you know, counting the cost for the last cigar that was purchased way back when. But uh, look, the auditor's office does have the legal authority to be able to look into the legislature, just like it does have the authority to look into the courts, which it has done. And I think a lot of legislators would welcome an audit. I've talked to folks in, uh, you know, in, in your area in the South Coast, uh, in New Bedford, in Fall River, in, in the whole region that have said, you know, that they would they would welcome an audit and that they think it's a great idea and that why not shine a light, you know, in the dark areas so that we can do better as a legislature and so that we can understand the budget better. And regarding, I think, what you're talking about regarding, you know, potential retaliation, um, look, I've stood up for the last 10 years and have been an independent voice. I have the most independent voting record in the state legislature. I have been known for standing up and speaking truth to power about transparency, accountability, and equity, calling out when we don't have time to read bills, you know, standing up when, uh, you know, we are forced to take roll calls on things that we haven't been able to read, making sure that folks are able to have public hearings for the bills that they put before the legislature, you know, calling out the fact that we're not subject to the public records law alongside of Representative Tony Cabral, who's been a leader on that effort for many, many years. And folks like us, look, we believe that the legislature should not be above the law. They need to see an audit as well as they are voting on the laws that impact our daily lives. And, you know, certainly I hope that there would not be uh, retaliation in trying to cut funding for resources or anything like that. Um, But I can tell you, I've been standing up for the last 10 years on matters of transparency and accountability, and I've also been able to be effective as a state senator, delivering millions and millions and millions of dollars for my district. We actually just, um, you know, secured uh, several million dollars to come back in the form of an economic development bill, not just for my community, but I was able to fight alongside of your state legislators who have done a fantastic job, whose endorsements I'm proud to have received in this race, Senator Roderick's. Uh, Senator Montigny, Senator Pacheco, Representative Cabral, Representative Hendricks, they've all been, uh, and I could go on, but they've all been fantastic in making sure to advocate for those funds to come back to our communities to help to increase economic development and job opportunities, good paying job opportunities. And I was proud to, you know, be able to support that piece of legislation recently to send those important funds back to our communities. And they were all, uh, uh, Rod, um, you know, Pacheco, Montigny, Hendricks, Cabral, they were all very early endorsers of you, even in the primary, actually. Um, so, Senator DiZaglio, we appreciate you making yourself available to us during this campaign season. I really enjoyed our interviews. I really enjoyed our discussions when I've seen you uh, when we were, you know, out in the field. And uh, looking forward to talking to you more uh, even after Election Day. I love the South Coast. 
I am so excited about the opportunity to potential to potentially be able to serve you in an elected capacity. I do want to say thank you, Marcus, for having me on uh, several times, whether it be in person, because I've been down there quite often, yes. Yes, you um, or whether it be over the phone. I'm so incredibly grateful. It's a very humbling opportunity just to be able to run. And I do respectfully and humbly ask for your vote for those who are listening at home. I'd love the opportunity to serve as your next state auditor, but I can't do it without you. So once again, uh, Diana DiZoglio, current state senator, running to be your next state auditor to make sure that working families like ours have access to and accountability from our state leaders and our state agency, regardless of our family background, our bank balance, or our zip code. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you and good back. luck. We appreciate good luck, it. Diana. Thank, Thank you. you. Take this break. Strong closer. Yes. For strong sure. closer. And steadfastly on message. Yeah, that's what I mean. Strong closer. 1420 WBSM can now be heard on 99.5 FM. You wash your hands. You never know who will call in the South Coast tonight. But they want to hear from you most of all. Call 508-996-0500. Or use the WBSM app to send an app, chat, text message, or leave voicemail. Hey, welcome back to the show. I'm Marcus. I'm Chris. So um, we're waiting for Attorney Jay McMahon and or Attleboro Mayor Haro, the sheriff candidate. Uh, so um, that's pretty much what we're doing now. We'll take your phone calls. We'll take your as phone well. calls in the interim at 508-996-0500. I thought that was we just talked about how what a major development that was for the for the state libertarian party. So folks, let me just to break it down real quickly for you. For years the libertarians weren't on the ballot. Yeah. They didn't have state party um, ballot access. They right. they were not considered a major party. Yeah. Um Generally speaking, they cut into the Republicans' vote, generally, yeah. in Massachusetts. That's a big problem for the Republican Party. It, it definitely is. The Libertarians get on the ballot every every election now, automatically. Good evening, you're live. Hey, Marcus, Jay McMahon calling, how are you? Hey, Jay, uh, you're, you're here with uh, me and, and uh, my co-host, Chris. So, um, so uh, Jay... It's been a long uh, campaign. You've campaigned. This is now your second campaign for attorney general. Um, how right. are you? How are you feeling about what's going to happen tomorrow? I'm feeling really good, Marcus. Um, I got to tell you, the the sentiment out there is that um, there people are angry with the economy. Now, I I'd like to think that the independents are listening to us. And that there is concern about public safety, uh, as I am for them. Uh, I'd like to think it's the opiate crisis that we want to talk about and that we, we've been uh, campaigning on for the whole season. But to be honest, what I'm getting from the independents, uh, they are just tired of the economy. And it's driving them crazy. And they're coming our way because of the economy. That's what I'm finding out. So, um, uh, as Attorney General, how can you help alleviate those economic concerns? Well, I'll tell you what. There's a lot of things that we can do. Number one, uh, it's the economic concerns, and it's also public safety. Clearly, public safety is what the Attorney General is all about. However, the Attorney General also has a say in public utilities. Now, I know you guys have talked about it before. And you've uh, heard that Maury Healy was bragging about shutting down the natural gas pipelines that need to come in. I don't know why she feels that she should be shutting off the natural gas now. If they want to go green, shouldn't they wait till the economy is ready to go green before they start turning it off? Because right now, people, the thing that's that's reflecting on us uh, candidates from the populace is that they are they are very angry about the way the economy is going and they feel it by having less disposable income in other words all the money they're earning is going to just getting gas in their car to go to work more in order to make it through next week they're paying more for food. The utilities have gone through the roof. And when you see right now that, that the electric prices, the, the price of electricity has doubled, uh, she's cutting, she, for whatever reason or other, she feels that we don't need natural gas in Massachusetts. 
And the Wall Street Journal is talking about the price of home heating oil doubling. So, Jay, um, our, you, but, our was, people was, on fixed incomes have a grim decision to make. So we're speaking of Jay McMahon, who's uh, run, running for attorney general. He's the Republican nominee this year. You're right down the road in, on, on the Cape. Um, one of the things that, that struck me about your candidacy is, Sadly, you lost your son to, to the opioid crisis. Um, right. On day one, if you get elected, you walk in your office. What are you going to be doing, Jay? Okay, so there's a number of things I'm going to be doing. Um, I don't know if you guys got a chance to see my video on Mass and Cass. Yes, we did. Okay. All right, I got to tell you something. I don't know why the government has given up on those people. Uh, the people on Mass and Cass, I have a heart for them. I want to see those people at rehabilitation. They have said to me they want good rehabilitation. They can't get off the drugs. And the problem with government programs are that they're a 99% failure. But private pay programs are an 85% success rate. Now, I've talked to opiate physicians in Massachusetts. I've talked to dozens of them. It, my message uh, gravitates to them, and they also like it because they know it to be true. The problem is it's the private pay programs that are successful. We need to bring the government programs up to the level of the private pay programs. Now, what can I do as an attorney general? Easily. If these programs are a failure, and they know they've been a failure for, a, for at least the last 10 years, They're holding themselves out of doing a service for the taxpayers, and they're getting paid for that service. And if they know that they're, that they're committing a fraud upon the Commonwealth and upon the taxpayers by delivering a faulty product, we got an issue. And that's what I can do. But basically, I'm not looking to put them out of business. I'm looking to bring them up to the standard of the, of the private pay programs so that we can have successful rehabilitation, get these people off mass and cast, get, get, give them their lives back. Attorney McMahon, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, I look forward to talking in, uh, to you in the future, no matter uh, what happens tomorrow. Good luck. Good luck. Hey, we'll have a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank Remember you. Remember to vote for me, Jay McMahon. Thank Thanks you. Bye -bye Thank now. you very much. All right, we're joined now by uh, Paul Harrow. Hey, Mayor Harrow. Hey, guys. How's it going? What's Good. Going so uh, you... Uh, I covered your um, your events the last uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we had Mayor Driscoll, Andrea Campbell, Dinah DiZaglio. There were strong turnouts. Um, they all, I think, impassionately pleaded uh, your candidacy for Bristol Sheriff. What did that mean uh, for you? Uh, I think uh, people you know, throughout the state, uh, especially in Bristol County, they recognize that it's time for change. Um, you know, I want to uh, make a little anecdote about the uh, last guest you had on the program. Uh, he said that 99% of government programs are failure and 85% of private programs are a success. But did you know that 57% of statistics are made up on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> you can ins insert whatever you want with those numbers is my point. You know, so I, 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 I you know, I've never heard of such a thing. But anyway, back to this race, though. I thought you might like that, Joe. 57%, 53%, whatever it is. A lot of times they're made up on the spot. A lot of times. So what percentage are you going to get tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hoping for over 51%, over 50%. You know, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful. So, uh, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but we've done everything we're supposed to do. And, uh, you know, one of the metrics I look at is that uh, 12 years ago, Sheriff Hodgson got 51%. I believe it was 51%. Um, sure. And he's a heck of a lot less popular now than he was 12 years ago. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, like I said, I've, I basically have my team to thank for all the hard work they did. Um, you know, got an outstanding group of volunteers that spent a lot of time doing sign holdings. They spent time uh, knocking on doors, you know, coordinating house parties. Uh, you know, we, they, you know, I've, normally when I run a race, uh, I'm kind of a, almost a one-man show. Uh, but there's no way that could happen with this. You know, it was, I really had to depend heavily on a lot of volunteers. Um, so, uh, Mayor Haro, we appreciate you coming on, making yourself available. This is a very important race, and you chose us to, to host the debate, and you made yourself available whenever we had asked. So we really do appreciate that. Before I let you go, where are you going to be on election night? 
uh, the Somerset VFW. We're going to start there around 7.30, 8 o'clock, something about that time. And uh, I chose Somerset because it's geographically uh, as close to the center of the county as we could find. Um, it was, uh, you know, like I wanted to be able to allow people from Attleboro and North Attleboro to drive down, but also from people from Fairhaven and New Bedford to drive up. So that's why I chose, uh, you know, Somerset. It was it was just geographically the center of the uh the uh, county, or as close to it as we could get. Mayor Hurley, I just yeah. want to, I, I just want to um, echo Marcus's uh, comments. I think people at home should know this. You always were available to us, um, and, and you were very easy to work with. Um, the debate, there was a couple ruffles there as we brought in other media, but again, uh, I do appreciate you being so available. I think it was very important, um, and uh, good luck tomorrow. Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, win or lose, if you guys want to have me back on uh, sometime, you know, absolutely. Just do, sure, we will. Like an after action review, you know, let's do it. Sounds absolutely. good. Absolutely. All right. Man. Thank you. All right. Oh, I accidentally hung up on him. Um, the, uh, again, I, I, both he and the sheriff have always been available. This is the biggest thing they've got going on, and they chose us to <laughs> right. be the one of the premier media outlets to cover it and have the debate. So I do appreciate that. We've got to take a break. What's up? What's up? We got a minute here, a minute, two minutes here. We got the sheriff on at 905. Right. After the sheriff, the phone lines are wide open. Right. I would advise you to call in then. Um, I hate not being able to get the callers, right. but we, I also wanted to put all these candidates in front of you. I, so. think, I think the candidates, you, you guys are going to have the rest of the year. Well, not only the rest of the year, five hours tomorrow. Right. But, you, be- but not only that, not only do you have five hours tomorrow and the rest of the year, you'll have like after that we have the sheriff on. Right. So Couple call in. Hours. Yeah. So if you call in then. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you right on. We'll get you right on. We'll, we'll be happy to talk to you. Um, we're just, you know, maneuvering that schedule. Um, takes some uh, dexterity and uh, doesn't allow for, and, 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 and a small margin for error. Right. So Flexibility, man. Flexibility uh, is important. So we have um, Sheriff Hodgson on at nine. You might have heard of him. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he'll be talking. He had a big standout today. Uh, I that went, was a big crowd. I went... Um, uh, and it was a big crowd. It was a big crowd, and people were surprisingly nice to me, <laughs> <laughs> including the sheriff, <laughs> including the sheriff, <laughs> including the sheriff, including his wife, including his wife. Yeah, she wanted me to record how many beeps they got in in my column tomorrow. So <laughs> the only thing I could think of is a chorus of horns. Well, when I heard him on the Howie Carr show, I could hear the beeps in the background. Oh, you called in from there? Yes. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. He gave a good speech to uh, to the crowd. So we're gonna um, we're gonna actually satellites kicking in. So we'll talk to Sheriff Hodgson, and then afterwards we'll take your calls.